This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I have the wonderful Jeffrey Wiseman on the show who's going to take us back to the future and other places into the Twilight Zone and <laughs> many other projects he has done as well. Welcome to the show, Jeffrey. Thank you, Greg. Hello, everybody. <laughs> yes. You have to explain to me what, how you came up with a Python hyena. You know, I get asked that quite a lot. And the only thing I can say is I've loved snakes since I was a kid. Uh-huh. And I've always found them fascinating, and um, especially uh, the big constrictors. And uh, and the spotted hyena, another one, you know, is just a fascinating animal, especially when you hear them cackle. But they're also two of the most looked down upon creatures on the planet as well, because uh, uh, I don't know whether it's because of uh, uh, Adam and Eve and the the in the Bible about the the snake. I don't know. Um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Satan could have turned into any animal, but uh, whatever. Um, but a lot of people, they hate the snake and they hate the hyena, but what they, they don't seem to realize is they, they um, have a very important uh, task in the environment because uh, snakes uh, are responsible for killing more uh, pests and um, and rodents than birds of prey and cats. Oh yeah, and and uh, other snakes. I I know where I live. Uh, there, when the rattler uh, population was large, they they give the government gave property owners king snakes. Oh yes, the rattlers. And uh, now now we only have king snakes. King snakes <laughs> are immune to venom. Did you know that? Lucky them. Yep, kings. Yeah, king snakes are immune to venom. They they hunt and kill rattlesnakes. Yeah, that's that's what I gather. Do you keep snakes yourself? I don't have one myself, no. But uh, I know the cover photo right now on my Facebook page is uh, me with a uh, a ten foot Burmese draped over my shoulder, which I had the opportunity to do that little photo with uh, some years ago, which oh. was nice. <laughs> yeah, I I don't mind them. But uh, and the spotted hyena, the thing with that, I find them really fascinating. Interesting personalities as well. But they say they got stomachs like cast iron. They um, eat a lot of the stuff that other creatures leave behind, including the bone. And um, I guess there was a documentary about how how uh, people throw so much stuff away, and hyenas pretty much clean up everything that is kind of harmful to the environment. Well, God bless them. Yeah. So I I like those two creatures. Plus, when I, I was growing up, like I'm, I'm going to be 45 in July, so I mean, but I still remember when I was in high school and junior high, I was bullied because I was not very adaptable socially, you know, I was a little awkward, and um, I had a hard time making friends, so I was bullied a lot. So maybe it's another thing is I can relate to the creatures that are often aren't liked as much. So oh, great! Yeah, hey, good for you. Compassionate. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I was just wonder if well, we thanks, could. Thanks for getting that explanation out to <laughs> me and, and the listeners that uh, I have been wondering. Well, like I said, I've had I've had a few of you have asked me about that. But that that's that's where it's come from. But um, I just wonder if you give us a little bit of your background. Oh, sure. Uh, I I was born at a very early age. Uh, of course, in the <laughs> I wanted to be close to my mom. Uh, I, I I was raised in in L.A. You know, around Hollywood, and my folks. Uh, were peripherally in the business in that my my dad ran a club. My mom often helped him that uh, had many members uh, coming there to play backgammon or bridge or what have you that were in show business uh, from Mike Sinkovich and his wife, Benny Barnes. Mike helped start the American Film Institute, and uh, Benny Barnes was a, a singer, comedian in, in uh, early film in the 30s and 40s. Uh, I remember as a child, young child, coming to the, their club and, and meeting 
Omar Sharif and Don Adams and Lauren Green, you know, uh, business partners and people who'd come to his, his club who were in the industry or, you know, associated with it. And I had always wanted to be an actor as early as I, I remember. I, I had a babysitter who kind of flipped out when uh, she met Omar Sharif with me at, at my dad's club. And then we went and saw him on a on the big screen in a motion picture and she flipped out again and and that kind of inspired me to want to, you know, get her attention. I was really fond of my babysitter, you know. Of course. Odd, but, uh, and so I, I always, you know, worked in class and at school in, in shows and plays and such. And uh, though it was kind of counter what my parents wanted for me, they, they really didn't want me going into show business. And, uh, but they couldn't stop me. Uh, I, out, out of high school, um, started uh, getting on big sets by just doing uh, background work. In fact, uh, just last evening, there was a, a 40-year anniversary screening of uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band with Peter Famine and the Bee Gees, uh, thus also it being the 50th anniversary of the release of uh, Sgt. Pepper's record. Uh, and I was a special guest because I, I have little tiny background roles in about four scenes in, in Sgt. Pepper's. And uh, it was really kind of bizarre seeing that on the big screen again and uh, seeing how really is a terrible film. <laughs> but, uh, but it was kind of fun reliving. Uh, I remember on that set in particular, immediately being very attracted to one of the dancers, just gorgeous and very friendly. And, and I buddied up with her for a couple of days. And this is in a scene where I, my character, along with dozens of others, are being brainwashed by Alice Cooper. <laughs> uh, who's playing the Sun King, um, and uh, on the the first couple of days uh, we only had Alice there on video, and then the third day he came in to shoot his stuff. And I remember that morning on that third day going in to Cheryl, the this dancer, and going you know right up to her because I I just adored her, and she said, "Oh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, come! I want you to meet my husband, Alice." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, yeah. It was really great to meet Alice for the first time. And, uh, uh, you know, it's little fun things uh, that happened on that set. And, and I try to, you know, really get into every set that I, I uh, am privileged to, to work on and either engage with the, the crew and, and learn the technical stuff with the, the advanced cameras that are often working or or just get to know people on the sets. And often I would get myself into trouble. I remember when I guest starred finally on a, uh, a TV series called Scarecrow and Mrs. King, um, you know, I got there so early and the only people around that seemed to be, you know, not engaged in what they were doing um, were the were the extras. And I went over and, and hung with them and chatted. And uh, after a while, one of the ADs found me. And when the extras heard that I was the guest star that week, they were all like, what are you doing over here with us? I was like, hmm. Well, I I just want to come socialize. Uh, but there is there is a uh, protocol and social setup hierarchy that um, is on movie sets. It's very interesting how over the years it kind of has changed. There's a, a more of a uh, separation of. of parties there and and I, I i'm against that i'd like to see more incorporation because it, it really every movie every story that you're telling it's it's a team effort and if there's this separation and not a feeling of community i think it, it'll fragment and not be as good as it possibly could can be um i brought to many sets on on films that i've worked with you know ideas and stories and things from my own life to help support the script and the story and and I've been fortunate on several different shoots that the directors will actually let me add to what we've got. And, and often it pays off in some gold, some really fun stuff. Yeah, I saw a photo uh, from Scarecrow and Mrs. King on Internet Movie Database. I guess Kate Jackson had you in a bit of a bind. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, my character uh, captures some footage of uh, these uh, international espionage artists and a kidnapping and and because I'm a my character's a uh, amateur filmmaker uh, they they come after me to get the footage and I my character ends up ends up getting kidnapped and I remember being stuffed into the trunk of the car probably about 15 takes uh, due to 
either a plane or a train or technical difficulty or something. It was it was not good for my claustrophobia. What's it like being kidnapped by Kate Jackson? <laughs> well, now she she she, uh, she isn't the one who kidnapped me. It was the other guys, the bad guys. She she was a pretty good guy in that one. Um, uh, she was uh, she was actually a, a, a little uh, uh, elusive. Uh, the first couple of days I was on set, I think she had had something in some bad rat, uh, press come out uh, uh, about her, and uh, I think whatever she was going through, she got through it, and by the third day we were having lunch together and, and having a good time with uh, Bruce Box Lightner. Did you meet and, Martha uh, Smith? Because I've interviewed Martha Smith from that show. You know, I had no scenes with her. She is in that episode, but I didn't get to do anything with her. Mine was mostly with uh, Kate and Bruce and then the the uh, other guest stars that were on that week. Uh, and But that uh, particular episode, uh, filming Raul, um, was rated like the second highest uh, watched. Um, got a lot of great response from, from people who, who watched it. I guess uh, I was helping do something right. And also I think they're the Scarecrow and Mrs. King's uh, romantic relationship was heating up, too. That might have had something to, to do with it there, too. Going back to Sergeant Peppers, I was just wondering, you know, uh, did you meet George Burns? I wish. <laughs> I've, I've been a, a huge fan of, of George and Gracie Allen for for a long, long time, and I, I, I uh, never see. You know, I don't think he was ever on set when I was, I was there. It was generally... Um, was it Sandy, the the gal who played Strawberry Fields and and Peter Frampton, the Bee Gees, Alice? I, I was in the Earth, Wind, and Fire. Got to get you into my live crowd scene. Um, but I, I am a big Alice burn. Cooper fan. I like Alice Cooper. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been fortunate to cross paths with him a few times. I back in high school had a very dear friend I dated uh, briefly named Terry Nunn, who is the lead singer of a band called Berlin. Oh, yeah. And, I love and, Berlin. I bought yeah, well, that Terry, CD, that 1981 CD that's got Sex, I'm a Man, and, oh, Pleasure Victim. It's called Pleasure Victim. Pleasure I bought, Victim. I got yeah. that CD. I love that CD. Well, uh, Terry was uh, a little before her time. I remember, remember in, in uh, high school, she was, already guest starring on TV shows like Blue Grant and Scared Straight and such, and, and she even uh, screen tested. It was apparently between her and Carrie Fisher for Princess Leia. For, oh, yeah? For Star Wars. And her screen test is even there on 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 YouTube somewhere. You could dig it out. But uh, Terry had invited me to come sing backup on one of her albums. I think it was Count Three and Pray, a Berlin album. And I, uh, will I Ever Understand You? A few other songs. I just did some vocal singing, you know, with groups mostly. And it was uh, the same producer who did The Wall and uh, some Alice Cooper records. And, and sure enough, I met Alice at, at the studio that day. And, uh, you know, I've crossed paths with him a, a couple times. And he's always been a, a really nice gentleman. It's funny. Like Alice, I, you'll, you'd like him. You should have him on your show. I would love to get Alice Cooper on my show. But uh, g- getting in touch with him is kind of difficult. Um, oh, you'll find him on the golf course down there in probably Arizona. <laughs> or something. I did reach out to Terry Nunn, but didn't get a response, because I know there's a Facebook page there for Berlin. But last year was the 35th anniversary of Pleasure Victim, and I actually was hoping to, to have her on to celebrate that. She's but busy you know she just did uh, the cruise to the 80s where she was a big hit and before we asked her back and and she's uh you know raising children uh she has teenagers and and a, a wonderful husband and is always touring she's a busy girl so i i would say just keep trying keep trying you know i don't even know a lot of folks just so you know uh, maybe they're, they they have a Facebook page if they're a celebrity, but it's probably not run by them. I, I remember when I got friended by Billy Bob Thornton on Facebook. I was like, wait a minute. How does Billy Bob know me? And, and, then, and then he wrote me and said, is this the Jeffrey Weissman who did murder mysteries back in the 80s? And I was like, he came to one of my, who is this? And, and it turned out to be his media person, my, my friend Amelie, who knew me from murder mysteries. And uh, so, so you get uh, both uh, celebrities who 
have the pages in their social networks, but they don't necessarily run them. If it's something really important or a job or something that is coming to them, they'll probably get it filtered to them eventually. Um, but more than not, it's it's uh, probably not them. <laughs> uh, I, I know uh, Jake uh, Galifianakis uh, wrote to all his friends, you know, I've got to close my Facebook page down, you guys, but I may come back as another name. But uh, it was in violation to his agreement with William Morris Endeavor Agency uh, because you can't, if you're a celeb, you can't generally speak publicly unless it goes through your publicist or, you know, whatever they have contractually in their, you know, public relations stuff. Um, so it's complicated. I, I, you know, I had Julie Andrews as a Facebook friend and she disappeared one day and I figured, oh, she probably had the same thing, just got over inundated or the agent said you got to shut it down. I don't know. Hmm. Hard, hard to, hard to explain. Yeah. Well, maybe eventually I'll connect with Terry, but, uh, Right now, dealing with you and your interesting career, I noticed you. You were. I noticed you on the Internet Movie Database. You're listed as uncredited for uh, Sergeant Peppers, and you're also listed as uncredited for a film that I really enjoyed called "I Want to Hold Your Hand." Yeah, that was the first film I ever was on the set of. Uh, like I said, I was fresh out of high school. I wanted to be on a movie set just to see what it was like, and I joined a, a company. I paid a small fee to get into these crowd scenes. And so I, on I Want to Hold Your Hand, uh, which was Robert Zemeckis' I think first film, yeah. um, the, uh, the scene was outside the Beatles Hotel in New York in, in January, you know, in the dead of winter. And we're shooting in the back lot of Burbank uh, of Universal, and it's 100 and some odd degrees, and the extras were all bundled up, and we're slowly dropping like flies, really. It was long hot day and heavy coats and wraps and such and uh, I, I think Zemeckis had a hard time with directing the crowd scene so he actually brought his friend uh, an up-and-coming director named Steven Spielberg to uh, direct those scenes and I was a uh, I was just a Ringo fan in, in that I wasn't uh, a principal at all by any means I, but I got on the set and I was starting to feel what it's like to work on uh, on film, on, on set, and so I Want to Hold Your Hand, FM, Sergeant Pepper's, The Rose, those were all, you know, background things, and, and eventually, as a, a, an actor who wants to sink teeth into a meaty part, it's not fulfilling. You know, it's, it's great to be on the set and rub elbows with stars and other working actors, but uh, ultimately, it's not fulfilling, so the only way really to be, for all you aspiring actors listening, to be considered serious about your career is to get training and i finally got that advice from i think it was helen hunt's father gordon hunt who was in casting uh and i went after training and went to the american conservatory theater and university and studied very hard and, and during that period i fell into an opportunity to screen test for the lead in a, a film originally called the genius with warren oates attached and uh the uh the film went into turnaround where it lost its backing and MGM and United Artists had merged and there was a lot of arguments whether or not they're going to make this film. Uh, it finally went ahead uh, without war notes and, and got other, other stars attached. And uh, I tested with Ali Sheedy and they changed the name of the film to uh, War Games. Okay. And uh, the same day I tested Eric Stoltz and Dana Carvey and uh, Brian Becker, uh, John uh, Stockwell from Christine, a lot of a lot of really great talents tested with Ali that day, and none of us got it. It ended up going to to uh, Matthew Broderick. Okay. But I did sign with a very very good agent and uh, started working. Finally, getting my first co-star filling in a, a movie called uh, Twilight Zone, the movie in the George Miller episode with John Lithgow on the remake of Nightmare at Thirty Thousand Feet. Okay. And that was incredibly exciting to work on because uh, there were uh, just lovely, lovely people in the ensemble cast. You know, Donna Dixon and J.D. Johnston and, of course, John Lithgow was a dream. Uh, and George Miller, who folk know from uh, Fury Road, you know, the Mad Max film. Oh, that yeah, was fantastic. They, I like that latest yeah. Mad Max movie. I thought it was the best one yet. 
and and he is a dream of a director. If he uh, likes you, you know, he gives you free reign to try things out in rehearsal, and often keeps them, uh, you know, in the film. And just a very fun, exciting director to work with. And and the cinematographer on that, Alan Davio, who had shot E.T., was fun to work with. And we also had a brand new contraption working on that film called the Steadicam, whose inventor, Garrett Brown, brought on the set and, and worked with us on that. And it was just exciting to, to see the Steadicam go from, I think back then it was like 65 pounds to now it's maybe 10 or 14 pounds or something. Uh, so uh, then from, from Twilight Zone movie, uh, I you know, for, finally got my name up on the credits on the screen and my parents were finally all right with me being an actor. It's unfortunately I, the Twilight Zone got a bad reputation though. Oh, it sure did. I was in fact totally surprised, caught, caught off guard when my agent called me with the audition three months after the terrible accident with Dick Moore and the children Yeah, uh, on John Landis' set. But Spielberg decided to complete the film since uh, that accident happened on the last day of shooting for that segment. And, uh, uh, you know, the rest is history. Uh, luckily, I was distanced from that terrible accident, and and uh, my the segment that I appear in was really one of the highlights of the film. Awesome. Uh, and shortly thereafter, I, I did a, a little tiny bit in uh, a film that Louis Maul directed with Sean Penn and Donald Sutherland called Crackers. Okay. Wallace, Sean, and, and Jack Warden, good people in that. And then... Uh, uh, Johnny Dangerously. I what was it little, like working? What was it like working for Amy Heckerling? Because speaking of Sean Penn, she had directed him in Fast Times at Ridgemont High the year before. Yeah, yeah. Which which put him on the map. Uh, and Sean was a year or so behind me at, at uh, the high school I went to. I was in class with his brother Mike Penn, and, and then I later on uh, co starred with his brother Chris in Tail Rider with Clint Eastwood. Yeah, but the. Uh, uh, Amy was was all business. She was very, you know, very East Coast and uh, a tight, a little tightly wound, and and just wanted wanted to keep the ball rolling. She was a lot of fun. To, um, you know, obviously, Michael Keaton adored her, and and uh, it was also one of those really fun sets to work on. First, the art direction, you know, being the Roaring Twenties, but with a sort of nineteen early nineteen eighties comedy feel. Joe Piscopo um, in it. Joe was a delight. I didn't have a scene with him, but I went out of my way to knock on his dressing room door to, to go chat with him, and he invited me in. We chatted for a better part of an hour how much he loved being on movie sets and uh, this, that, and the other thing. He was just a delightful person. I, I hope Joe is doing well. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Mary Lou Henner was, was delightful. I don't know if you know this or not, but there was a... Uh, Originally, Johnny Dangerously was going to be a good part musical. There were a lot of musical numbers that were cut from the film. Oh, okay. Uh, they ended up showing them at the rap party. Uh, now, I wasn't, my part wasn't very big. I was the I Heart Johnny t shirt vendor selling the shirts in the scene with Dom DeLuise as the Pope. Okay. And, uh, and Dom and I became friends on that, on that set and, and remained friends until his death uh, just recently. But the uh, the rap party, I was in between acting jobs. I really wasn't making a living yet as an actor, and uh, I would do other jobs like, like catering. And, and my catering company that I worked for happened to get the the rap party at Century Fox for for Johnny Dangerously. And I remember I w went over and served drinks to Michael Keaton and Amy Heckerling, and I watched Michael lean over to Amy and said, it "Isn't?" Isn't he in the film? <laughs> so it was nice to be remembered by Michael. Uh, <clears throat> and it's just wonderful to see Michael's career take the uh, amazing journey that it, it has. Yeah. From Beetlejuice to... Uh, Birdman. To Birdman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Fun. yeah. Uh, so let's go mention for I Want to Hold Your Hand. Like, I remember so well Nancy Allen and the uh, guitar and that little intimate s scene. That 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 was that was Fifty Shades of Grey back then. <laughs> Did you yeah. meet, meet her or uh, Teresa Saldana, God Rest Her Soul? Uh, no, ironically, 
uh, an old girlfriend of mine was cousins with Teresa. And uh, I knew a lot of the inside tracks of the, the tragic things that happened to her. And uh, But no, I didn't know her personally. Um, so it was interesting to have the, the connection through my friend Jill. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, you get into the acting family, it's amazing how small it really is. You, the, you, you'll find people that you work with have worked with others that you know closely and you don't realize it until maybe years later, just as I'm doing now. <laughs> you you had uh, mentioned Pale Rider. Now, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I um, you we don't have drive-in theaters here anymore. But um, I remember my family used to go to the drive-in, and we you know, we saw the Star Wars films there, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, E.T. and stuff like that. And I remember, um, I guess we saw something one night, and then uh, my parents wanted us to go to sleep in the back while they watched. Uh, in the back seat while they watch Pale Rider. And uh, I remember I caught a glimpse of the, this, and uh, uh, no offense, it was not my favorite Clint Eastwood movie, um, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, I, I made one argument with my parents, because they always resented that my brothers and I liked slasher films. And I said, look, you guys just took us to the drive-in where we saw Clint Eastwood shoot up an entire town. And it reminded me of something I read later uh, from uh, Wes Craven or Sean S. Cunningham when they made Last House on the Left. And it was their answer to the Vietnam War. And they said when they made Last House on the Left, it was um, they remember they saw Clint Eastwood Western in the 60s. And it was all bang, bang, you're dead, you know. And they said if they're going to make a, a movie, they, they thought you should at least care about the people being victimized. And, of course, Last House caused a lot of controversy. But it kind of reminded me of that when my when I thought my parents uh, went to Pale Rider and I caught some of these scenes. <laughs> But uh, what was your experience like working with Clint Eastwood? Uh, it was really fascinating and really wonderful. I uh, remember that just getting to the audition uh, was was interesting in that my agent at the time uh, was quite a hustler in finding what might be casting that wasn't in the breakdowns. The breakdowns is what casting directors and production companies use to get what they're looking for to agents. And uh, I think it was Lauren Lloyd at Warner Brothers said, we have a part in this Western, but we, we're going to cast it from our own files. She said, well, what, what, tell me who you're, what type you're looking for. Maybe I have someone on my client list. And I happened to fit the, the role they were uh, looking for. And uh, long story short, Chris Penn had met Clint at a party in Malibu and, and said, I want to work with you. Clint sent him Pale Rider and offered him the role of Teddy Conway, one of Spider's boys, and Chris threw it back and said, I want a bad guy role. I don't want to play a good guy. And so so Chris was moved into the uh, LaHood's son's role that attempts rape on Sidney's character and is a bad boy. And uh, that opened, uh, the actor who was playing Eddie, I'm sorry, Teddy Conway was moved to Eddie, so Chris was originally offered Eddie. And then, so Teddy became available, and I went in, and I auditioned. I, I had wanted to leave nothing to chance, uh, so I had uh, three different techniques available to me so I could cry on cue. The audition was to cry over my daddy's dead body, who had just been shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a lock of my grandmother's hair in my pocket, who, who always uh, encouraged me to be an actor when everyone else said, don't do it. Uh, and uh, I had... You know, sense memories and emotional recalls is old uh, Lee Strasberg, Stanislavski based uh, exercises ready to go, and and then the Meisner fantasy charging uh, technique. I, I wasn't going to leave anything to fate, and and it was very zen in that the script really worked, and I was in the moment enough and imagined uh, my my father's dead body there, and then the tears came, and and that worked on the tape that Fritz Manns, the uh, producer, sent to Clint, and I was hired, and. Uh, when I got the script, I was like you. I was like, "Oh my God, there's all this this violence here, this gratuitous killing." And and uh, you know, it was a, a cross between High Plains Drifter and Shane, and you know, it was kind of typical Western fare. Um, but then I also weighed, you know, do I want to turn down my first big meaty role of 
co-starring with Clint Eastwood. You don't want to turn that down, no. <laughs> not necessarily. And also, it was also biblical in its uh, theme. You know, pale rider, pale ghost. Uh, he uh, His character appears out of the woods uh, in the snow. Uh, mysteriously, he is a ghost. If you, if you see it uh, for what it is, it, there's a scene where the, the preacher takes off his, his shirt in uh, Carrie Snodgrass's character's cabin. Mm -hmm. And she looks at his back from the back, and there are the uh, scars from the bullet holes where his heart had been shot out. And John Russell, his character, kind of recognizes him just before he's shot by the mysterious preacher um, because he's a ghost. He realizes he's come back from the dead for revenge over all these uh, poor people they've, they've been persecuting so they can destroy the environment with their type of gold mining. I mean, it's a, it's all it's a parable. And looking at it that way, it's a lot easier to take all the gratuitous shooting and, you know, killing. Um, and, of course, you get to— I loved, I loved the next Western Clint did. Unforgiven. Oh, yes. Just mag magnificent. I even sent Clint uh, a very special cigar. <laughs> I hope he got it and smoked it um, when he got nominated for an Academy Award. You also, too, in that film, you get to work with, of course, Mike, Michael Moriarty in it, Carrie Snodgrass. Yeah, sits. Michael, Michael's a gem of a, a human being. I hope he's doing well. Yeah. He, uh, he, he would always, after every conversation with, you know, well, God bless you, Jeffrey. You know, he was a gentleman and uh, really uh, nice, beautiful nature, uh, a, a real giver. He had quit the film, actually, at one point. Oh, yeah, I don't know if you recall when uh, Hull Barrett, just after actually Brother and I both say, you go into town, ain't that kind of dumb? And uh, he goes to town and has the fight with the the, the hoodlums there. And uh, I'm not sure if it was uh, Charlie Hallahan, one, one, of, one or two of the, the actors that they were, he was chore to choreograph the fight with didn't stick to the choreography or were messing around or something, and Michael ended up getting hurt and breaking two or three fingers on his left hand, I think it was, or was it right hand? Anyway, he, he broke some fingers on his hand, and he actually quit the, quit the film. It took Clint a few days to get him back on the set. And Michael had been commissioned to apparently write some music or a symphony, and uh, not having those fingers really upset him. Uh, Clint got him one of those m m uh, melotone, melotron, uh, a keyboard that you can blow into and use one hand to, to play, and compose on that well, okay. while on set so, so michael got back on carrie snodgrass almost quit at one point because she butted, butted heads with clinton michael over things she thought her character should do be able to do i would talk carrie down over you know a picture of strawberry margaritas let her talk it out and, and get her calmed down she stayed on the set thank goodness what about sydney penny a lot of good people though on that shoot really wonderful what about sydney penny she was adorable. Everyone loves Sydney, and her father, uh, Hank Penny, who's a, a country music uh, writer, and her mom were, were there, and they were lovely people. Uh, and Sydney's, you know, grown up to be as gorgeous as she was as a child, as an adult, and, and is raising a beautiful family. She and her husband have a wonderful barbecue sauce called Curly's. Okay. Oh well. And of course, you know. I think the, probably what you're most famous for is taking over the role of George McFly in uh, Back to the Future two and three, and yeah, I, I got I, I get uh, yeah I get people who, are, who, who uh, I'm famous for that, and some people you know love me for it, and others hate me for it. It's very odd. Well, here's yeah. the thing. I, I'm gonna say this. <laughs> I, I I love Crispin Glover. You know, I, I liked him in Friday the 13th, the final chapter. I liked him in Back to the Future. I'm not sure all the details of what happened there, you know. But uh, I like what you brought to George McFly, too. And uh, Back to the Future Part 3, I, I wasn't quite as big on because I, I, I felt a lot of the originality was kind of drained, whereas those first two films, especially in the second one where he they went into the future and all this of course, we're heading towards 2025, <laughs> so I don't think any of that stuff is happening. Just like uh, 2019 and Blade Runner, well, we're approaching it. <laughs> we're, uh, we have yeah. those predictions we'll have didn't see. happen. 
I, you know, there was, there was, uh, I, ha- I was a great admirer of Crispin as well. I had uh, worked on a film with him at the American Film Institute the year before he got the first Back to the Future movie, and I thought it was compelling, a really interesting and fascinating actor. I even got his number to stay in touch. And then when I saw him in, I didn't know he was in Back to the Future when I went to see the original, and I was like, I know that guy, he's great. Mm-hmm. And he knocked it out of the park. Yeah. And uh, it was really interesting. I was in between movie and television gigs, working at Universal Studios in Hollywood, playing uh, characters. I played Stan Laurel and Charlie Chaplin and Groucho Marx okay. on the tour. And I got a call from someone, who, uh, an agent rather, who uh, was a good friend who supplies uh, lookalikes and doubles. And he offered Kevin, uh, who doubled Michael J. Fox on Back to the Future 2 and 3, and in other films as well. And he asked if I knew who Crispin was and if I thought I was anywhere the same height as him because they were looking for a photo double or stand-in for him. And I said, no, nah, he's he's a little taller and heavier than me, but uh, get me in there. Is this for the Back to the Future sequels? And he said, I'm not at liberty to say. And <laughs> I said, get me in there. And I met with the, the assistant directors, and they talked with the director about me, and then I went to casting, and they passed me, and I went to the next step to, to screen test. Oh, get, first get fitted for the prosthetics to make me look similar to Crispin, age 17, mm-hmm. uh, and then prosthetics for the older George, 77. And I did a screen test for for um, Bob Z, Bob, Robert Zemeckis and, and Dean Cundey, and they agreed that they had Crispin without the trouble. When I heard without the trouble and that they had Crispin, I was confused because in my mind they were going to need, like they needed Michael at two places at one time in the same shot. They were going to need George at two places at one time in the same shot. This is what because I hadn't read a script yet. Okay. And I, uh, sort of in the eleventh hour, I found out that I was going to be playing the role that Crispin was out, and I couldn't fathom that. I was like, "How is that? That's not possible. How you can't do it without him." I, no, I can't do it in these makeups that don't look me let make me look. It was it's just odd. Um, and they ended up, you know, using footage of him from the first film spliced in with my work. When you see George knocking Biff out mm-hmm. in the high school parking lot at the prom, uh, or kissing Lorraine on the prom, the under under the sea enchantment under the sea dance dance floor, uh, that's me, you know, spliced in with a couple of close-ups of Crispin. And so Crispin, of course, got sort of short shrift there. But then again, he probably shot himself in the foot by making too many demands by rumors that I had heard was that he wanted the same money as Michael J. Fox and then he went down to a million and that but he wanted script approval and so on and so forth which I don't think Spielberg and Zemeckis and company were going to give him so but then again to use his footage and likeness without his approval was kind of underhanded so naturally he sued and that's when he came to me for help and I spoke with him and uh you know, they settled out of court. Crispin was going to keep subpoenaing and deposing hundreds of people, uh, upsetting you know everyone's uh, day until they settled or did something before it went to court. And they didn't think they were going to win in court or something, so they ended up giving Crispin three quarters of a million dollars to to go away. Oh, that's so unfortunate. Paid pretty handsomely, you know. I imagine his attorneys took most of that, but he got paid, and and the Screen Actors Guild has a, a ruling at, uh, saying that a, an actor's image can't be used by a producer without their permission. So it was nice to be part of that historical bit. But it, the best part, really, is being a part of that Back to the Future family. Yeah, the, uh, the you, wonderful you, talent. You get the you get to fly the upside down. Crew. You, you got to fly upside down. <laughs> yeah, I got to stay, stay upside down for a couple of weeks. To get to, to Thirty seconds of screen time, and uh, the uh, the thing was, while I was doing that, uh, one of the crew came over and said, "I think all this punishment was meant for Crispin." You know, I was like, "Oh yeah, great." Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah we, you know, it was on a a, a rail. They, were, they, had, they built a rail going from outside the front door all the way through the living room through to the kitchen of the McFly household of 2015. Uh, and they didn't like getting me down. They built a, a little platform on 
a ladder so I could do like a sit up in midair and they'd slide it under me and I'd lie back on it while everyone would go and get coffee and take a break. I would still be hanging there, but <laughs> relaxing. <laughs> and some of those days, I tell you, those shoots, I remember one week of shooting that upside down stuff, the ortho lev, uh, I had on my time card a 19 hour day, a 22 hour day, a 26 hour day. Uh, a lot of it, was because we'd have technical difficulties and there was a lot of makeup to get into. The makeup took four hours a day to get into, another hour to take off. And then there were so many technical things when we're working with this. This is pre-really computer programs, CGI effects. Uh, the computer, the Panavision VistaFlex, VistaVision Panaflex uh, was run by a early program called the Tondro that was able to somehow splice the camera, or I'm sorry, splice the film inside the camera so Michael could play those multiple roles. And in between, you know, shooting each role, he had to go and redo the makeup and wardrobe and everything. And it meant for very long days. And we often only had Michael in the evening since he was doing the last season of Family Ties during the day. What was it like was to like work Michael with Michael? Michael? Michael, when do you sleep? And he said, I'm in the limo in between the studios. Uh, Michael's a, a, a penultimate professional. A very, very fine gentleman uh, who's feisty, you know, even though he's been, uh, you know, afflicted with the, the pain of uh, Parkinson's and the horrible physicalities that he, his physical problems he has to go through with that. He's still, at his core, this wonderful, feisty Michael. You know, it's just terrific to see his strength and perseverance and, and keeping uh, keeping himself, you know, as much as his wonderful self that he is. He, he really is a, a wonderful guy. Um, and he uh, was great to work with. Yeah, my, Michael's quite a staple of the 80s. He was in one of my favorite Canadian films, which was Class of 1984. And he did that. Oh, yeah. Yep, I, I've done uh, several interviews from that film, and um, yeah, he's uh, of course the Back to the Future films. He he kind of skyrocketed, and and that went on to Team Wolf and uh, Stuart Little and uh, all that stuff. And uh, but I was uh, thinking I was going to be cast. I had a really great callback for a film that he started in called The Secret of My Success. Okay, uh, and. Uh, I, I heard that I didn't get it because I was too tall. That, you know, Michael's about five six, I think. Okay. And uh, I guess I, I was too tall for that role. But, of course, a few years down the line, I'm playing his dad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and hanging upside down. <laughs> yeah, so it can be eye to eye. A little bit of trivia. Uh, when Mar uh, Marlene, Michael is my granddaughter, answers the door, and I'm hanging upside down there, uh, my head, because it's hanging upside down, was just about parallel with, uh, uh, you know, Michael's, Marlene's bottom, and that they'd put him, her, in uh, orange hot pants and stuffed them to give her him her uh, a butt, uh, which made it look like she had a pumpkin butt, and I, I came up with that line, how's granddad's little pumpkin? <laughs> Between the two Back to the Future films, uh, did you have, the, have a preference? I, I, I like the second one best out of the two, but do you, do you prefer the third or the second? Uh, the first. No, I mean uh, the ones that you was in. I know, but that, my, the first one is hands down my favorite. It just is so fantastic. It's, it's I agree, really, yep, I agree. It breaks a lot of rules on, on screenwriting and filmmaking and such, and it's it, been it just so wonderful. Um then again, they almost shot it twice, having shot eight weeks or so for with Eric Stoltz, so they they were practiced. But uh, the, uh, the I think the third one, I I enjoyed the third one a little bit more than the second one. The second one was really loud and and complicated, sometimes hard to hard to follow. And uh, but I've now seen it on the second one on Blu-ray now, uh, which makes it look like a new film. It just is oh, yeah. more vibrant, comes alive, and the special effects are even more fun. Um, so, it's a, I mean, it's a tough call. I, I uh, love all the uh, cowboy, the Western uh, references and jokes and things in, in Part 3, and it has 
that lovely love story between Doc Brown and, and uh, uh, oh, what's his uh, his wife? <laughs> uh, Mary Steenburgen. Yeah, Mary Steenburgen's yeah. character. I'm trying to. Uh, I'm just having a brain fart and on her. And of course, of course B- Biff making for a hilarious villain. <laughs> yeah, Griff's gang. Yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, Bu- Bru- Bruford. Uh, Buford. Uh, there was some really fun stuff. Really fun stuff in part three. I I enjoyed it a little bit more. But then again, you know, I'm barely in that film. There's, I think I worked one day. Okay. Yeah. Um. I, there, there was a neighbor shooting with their home camera from next door when we were shooting on location there. Okay. And they posted it on YouTube or somewhere. And I think I'm more in that footage than I am in the film. <laughs> I interviewed Sean Sullivan as well. and He was in uh, Back to the Future 3 as well. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is he one of the Cowboys? Um, I don't remember. It, uh, it's been so long since I've seen, seen the third one. The third one's my least favorite because I found when they went back to the old West, it didn't have wasn't quite as inventive as say what the first two was. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, two and three were originally one script called Paradox. Yeah. And I, I figured that they figured that they could double their money uh, if they made it into two films. Yeah. Well, it was fun when they went into the future in that second film, though. There was a lot of real creativity there with the, the hoverboards and stuff like that. Oh, magnificent design team on on the flying cars and the hoverboards and Jaws 19, the hologram and uh, the Cafe 80s. There's just one thing after another, to keep, eye candy to keep you giddy. Oh, it yeah. Was, it was It was a lot of fun. Yeah, you got some other films down here. A lot of these I haven't seen, but I'm going to ask you about them though. Um, w- one that I kind of uh, took notice of is, uh, I guess, a comical documentary. Now, I haven't seen this, but caught my attention. Called Court. Oh yeah, it's a, more of a mockumentary, uh, a la Christopher Guest, uh, Dustin Show, or Waiting for Guffman. Okay, and uh, that. Uh, one centers on the world of, of the wine trade. And in that one, I play an obsessive compulsive winemaker and uh, who eventually becomes the hero. Uh, you know, he's a, kind of a pain and eccentric <laughs> is the thing, and he, he ends up kind of being the hero of the film. It's quite fun. And I'm currently trying to figure out how to get someone to redistribute redistrib- that one because it's uh, not tied to anyone right now and it's not streaming anywhere and it's really a lovely film it it won many awards at the rome international film festival at the wine and grape film festival the sonoma valley film festival it's it wins where uh, either audience awards or or uh, best in its category awards wherever it screens um but it never got a, a wide theatrical release which i was too bad it, it was shot just before digital really became uh the norm uh, so maybe it's because the quality, you know, isn't isn't great. Uh, but the film itself is just delightful. A lot of fun. The, uh, an ensemble cast of great comedians. Um, I'll tell you what. What I'll do is I'll I'll keep working on getting it, uh, getting its distribution thing figured out again when it becomes available, either streaming or for rent or what have you. I'll, I'll give you a holler and maybe you can announce it on your show. Yeah, because uh, it actually looks interesting. Uh, it's just one that caught my attention. It's hilarious, and it's one of those uh, jobs that I uh, lucked out in that uh, my my wife is in the wine trade. Okay. And so to prepare for that role, I had her as sort of my consultant. In fact, I even got her to, to do a cameo in the film as my wife okay. in it. Uh, as she's leaving me because uh, my character is so obsessed with harvest that she's just, she's fed up and she's come to collect a couple cases of wine and go move into her mother's. It's a very funny scene because my character is trapped in between the barrels doing a tasting and can't get out quick enough to try to talk her down. But uh, the, the uh, script itself had a, a lot of things that I wasn't familiar with that are wine uh, oriented terms or what histories and things like this. And so I would have her to, to uh, 
to explain me, to me the things I didn't understand. And then I would also use inspirations and, and backup material from my own life and stories that I knew. And I would come on to the set with, and immediately go to the writers and directors and say, can I try this out? Can I use this? Can I use this? And I ended up uh, improvising or bringing new material to support the material. Uh, and about 30, 35% of my performance is just that, stuff that I brought to the to the page. Okay. Um, which is really rewarding. Uh, and, and, you know, the way Christopher Guest works, he works often with really competent improv artists and who have a strong uh, sense of character and, and can do anything if you throw almost anything at them. And, and it was really... Uh, rewarding because I've spent many years working on improv, uh, doing uh, theater sports, which originated up there in Canada with Keith Johnstone. Um, and and it kind of paid off in a, a big way because it, it is uh, a big part of my performance in that in that movie. Okay. How about uh, Slapdash? Slapdash is another one that should get a wide release. It uh, hadn't... Uh, gotten a release yet and uh, at the uh, preview or the, the cast screening um, the, the theater it was screening at made the mistake of charging uh, patrons to come see it and that was in violation of the union rules and so the union came after the filmmaker and the filmmaker took it on the lam went on uh, underground um, but it is a terrific film you might be able to find DVD copies of it for like 40 bucks or something it's, it's sort of a cult thing now but it's a a fun little film. It's a sort of a, a caper. Of, uh, I play a two-bit dealer who tries to make a big score um, with his his partner um, has pretty much stolen a couple hundred pounds or kilos of, of pot mm-hmm. and uh, murdered a cat to get it. And the, my character tries to sell it to the crime boss whose guy was murdered uh, and it was stolen from. So my, my character walks right into a, a big mess and I get kidnapped again. I, I have this thing about getting kidnapped for some reason, these characters I play. And uh, and all hell breaks loose. The main characters of the film, though, are, are a, a, a bad drunk clown, a has-been magician, and a reforming prostitute. <laughs> so it's a very dark comedy, and it, it was really cleverly written and, and well-made, I thought. And of course, uh, speaking of uh, weird, you were in Flying Saucer Rock and Roll. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, an interesting little low budget thing. I, I had been uh, helping a, a writer develop some projects, and his son was making this little passion sci fi film, and, and I just did a little cameo on, in it to help him. And, and he he's marketed it, it's all over the place. It's just a terrible movie about. Uh, outer space zombies, uh, pot-smoking zombies that make (laughs) humans into zombies uh, with their radioactive uh, marijuana. Somehow I doubt it would affect the trailer part, boys. Yeah, probably not. (laughs) (laughs) Those those guys could beat them. (laughs) And, of course, uh, 2001 A Space Travesty, Leslie Nielsen, love them. Yeah, you're hitting all the winners. Uh, No, uh, 2001 A Space Travesty is just... Terrible. I, I have a tiny cameo in there as Groucho, and they didn't frame me well. They, those producers uh, should be ashamed of themselves. I, in fact, talked with Leslie Nielsen briefly uh, shortly before he died, a year or two before he died, about that film, and he, he even said he got screwed by those guys on that film. Oh. Don't see it. Boycott it. Uh, <laughs> love Leslie, though. I think he's one of the funniest oh, guys who ever lived. He is a gem. He is a gem. He's just terrific. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, you've gone to the comic cons and whatnot. I just wonder and tell me about a little bit of your experiences at these comic cons and any interesting things that you're asked to sign. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, I I adore the cosplayers. I see so many creatives making these amazing costumes. I, I took footage of a kid. He must have been I don't know eight years old, but he was in a I don't want to say, yeah, I guess the life size for him, Chewbacca, uh, Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> he actually made a Jabba the Hutt outfit that was, I guess, what, eight feet wide. <laughs> and, and, and yet he was able to walk around in it and spin in it. I just, I was amazed. Uh, 
and the you know these beautiful girls in, in their different uh, superhero outfits and these guys in their superhero and villain outfits and I recently did the uh, first New Jersey Horror Con and Film Festival and I'd say 80% of the attendees all came dressed. Same with the the Doctor Who show, the Gallifrey One. I, the majority of the attendees come as a doctor, a companion, or a villain. And it's so exciting to see people participate and get into it. And, and uh, I've become friends with some really great professional cosplayers who have the abilities to sew and fabricate. And, and it's just exciting as can be, uh, uh, their expertise and how great they are. And often they're very friendly people. Uh, the strangest things that I've uh, been asked to sign, uh, DeLorean owners want me to sign their, their DeLorean. Okay. Whether it's a time machine or not, I, I'll sign the dashboard or a, a, a sun visor, sometimes a, under the hood or the hood itself. And that feels odd. I've, I've, I've signed uh, guitars. In fact, a couple of years ago, the London Comic Con brought over 11 of the cast members from the Back to the Future movies. And the owner of that show asked me, you know, how, how can I get Michael here? And I said, well, make it a fundraiser. Probably that'll probably do it. And sure enough, Michael showed up. It was the first con that Michael had finally appeared at uh, as a guest. Wow. Uh, you know, announced, an announced guest. He's arrived at others unannounced. But I, one of the first things we did is we all signed a, a rare edition Gibson guitar that Gibson donated. And that guitar went to auction and sold for like $20,000, which of course went to Michael's Parkinson's Research Foundation. Oh, fantastic. It is. Fantastic. I love that. There's my friends uh, from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, uh, Oliver and Terry Holler, who come to Canada several times and travel the world with their time machine DeLorean that they really built from the ground up. Uh, they exclusively raise money for the Fox Team Fox and the Michael J. Fox's Parkinson's Foundation. And they've raised probably, I don't know, they're probably into their second hundred thousand dollars of money or more that they've raised for the cause. And it's just terrific. Now Chris Lloyd wants them exclusively at the Comic Cons he does and it's really uh, a nice nice situation for them. Hmm. So wondering uh, what kind of projects that you are you working on now that you would like to plug? I've got a, a dramatization of Mark Twain's visit to Europe and the Holy Land from 1867 that I shot really, gosh, seven or more years ago. That's finally coming, I believe, to PBS this year. Okay. So keep an eye out if you get PBS up in Canada. Um, it's called Jerusalem, oh no, Dreamland, Mark Twain in Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, and it's gone, gone through a lot of changes. And, and since doing, playing uh, Sam Clemens, Mark Twain, in that project, I've done uh, numerous living history events as Mark Twain, and that's been very rewarding, and I'm trying to develop a show based on his shadow life. Uh, I have a, a few Comic-Con uh, appearances coming up. Just, I guess, check out my website, jeffreyweissman.com, on the news page. Okay. I should have the announcements there, or the Back to the Future fan page also has updates on all the cast members' appearances. Okay. Uh, I just uh, finished about 10 months in a, a live show called The Speakeasy, which is an immersive, interactive show that takes place in a 1923 speakeasy, and I was part of a vaudeville team singing and dancing and doing comedy and then a lot of drama. And that is a very unique show uh, because you're right there with the actors in the environments and part of the action often. Um, I've always got uh, film projects that I'm trying to develop and uh, I also teach. I, I have uh, a half dozen either students or young folk that I've been mentoring that are working in Hollywood now. You also and, got uh, a film called Damn California, too, uh, right? Damn California, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That uh, was a, an independent feature that some uh, young filmmakers up in Lake Tahoe produced about uh, the uh, political crisis over uh, water water uh, usage. Okay. Well, you know what, Jeffrey? It, it was just fantastic having you come on my show this evening. 
And I want to say a special thanks to Steve Joyner for hooking us up. I'm assuming you encountered him the same way I did on social media. Yeah, Steve's uh, really uh, helped a lot of uh, character actors get out there and, and do podcasts and appearances and such. He, he should be a, a PR man. Yeah, I think so, too. He's, he's trying to get me out there more as well. Um, I'm always kind of a baby steps kind of guy. Um, I usually prefer other people handle that stuff for me, but um, like him, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a volunteer at it right now, at least, anyway. And uh, But uh, I know I was doing this a couple of years before I actually encountered him, and um, yeah, it's it's been pretty fantastic. Yeah, he's, he's a good guy for uh, being a catalyst, connecting people. Yeah. Good stuff, Steve. Thanks. Yeah. And, and thank you for having me on your show. I, uh, I hope that uh, work brings me to Canada more. I, I was up at the uh, Hamilton Comic Con uh, a year or so ago, and I may be coming up for next year to the Niagara Falls one. you got to get over to uh, New Brunswick. Well, if you, you know the, the powers that be there, introduce me. And I'll, oh, I, I'll gee, I, I, w- I wish I could do that. And I've had people say that they haven't done a signing in Canada. Can I arrange something? And I'm completely powerless. It's it's like the, the government here don't want to support the arts, and that just sucks, you know. I'm oh, but it's so beautiful there. I, I you know, I've skated uh, the, the rivers in Ottawa and, and uh, love British Columbia. I'm just, uh, and you know, I spent... A little time doing a tour for Air Canada, promoting um, a, a, one of their uh, sales for airfares, uh, and and toured uh, Nova Scotia, Montreal, Toronto, uh, uh, as Laurel as Stan Laurel, uh, my Laurel and Hardy team. Uh, and when we were with Universal, uh, were put on this tour. I got to throw out the first pitch at an Expos game. Uh, did television shows Montreal and and then Toronto and radio spots it was really wonderful I had a great time in Canada oh fantastic well you know what Jeff it was just fantastic having you come on taking us back to the future into the twilight zone and (laughs) all all those other things and uh of course uh uh a couple of years ago, uh, I, th- I think it was back. To the, all three Back to the Futures had a, a really nice uh, re-release screening here at the theater here in Fredericton, and um, and um, I know I, I've uh, I saw the third one when it originally came to the theater, so I couldn't wait to see the first two, and um, I know I've seen the first one since uh, um, uh, three or four times in the theater, so it's. Uh, it's always nice seeing it's a that. Different experience when you see it on the big screen, ain't it? It is. I I find I find too. Like um, people, a lot of times now are going to Netflix, but it's just recently I saw The Graduate for the first time on the big screen. I've seen it a lot of times on home on disc on Blu-ray, mm-hmm. but I saw it for the first time in a movie theater for its 50th anniversary, and I never realized how funny the movie was until I saw it with an audience. And um, if we lose the theaters, you know, lose that experience, we lose something of the movies. Uh, oh, gen- yeah, and, and there are too many people out there who are going to advocate for keeping keeping the, you know, the silent film festivals and the, the art houses. We, we can't lose the theaters. If you haven't ever seen, for example, uh, uh, Laurel and Hardy or W.C. Fields mm-hmm. uh, comedy on the big screen, you're really missing out. There's so much... Those films were crafted by artists to work on the big screen in theaters with audiences. They were, were cut, edited to play the laughs that are in the house. And uh, seeing uh, Buster Keaton or Chaplin on the big screen, oh, yes. there is nothing else like it. Uh, oh. Mel Brooks, the same thing. He's, he's, he's crafted those things uh, for the theaters, you know, and, and uh, like you say, with the responses of the audience around you. Absolutely. Well, I was wondering if before you go, if you would do a plug for my show. Sure. What do you want me to say? Just say uh, your name and that you're listening to Greg Gilbert, that, you know, my name, of course, on Python's Paradise. That's the name of my show in New Brunswick, Canada. Good luck. <laughs> Just say you're, know when you're ready. You're ready? Shoot. Yeah. 
Hi, this is Jeffrey Weissman. You probably know me from Back to the Future 2 and 3, Pale Rider, and other films and TV shows. And you're listening to Greg Gilbert's Python Hyena from New Brunswick,